thanks to uh, Catherine Townsend Lyon, who is going to be speaking here shortly, uh, a resident here in Phoenix that has uh, not only the social media manager for this ride around America, travel agents, booking agents, uh, liaison of all kinds. Uh, she has been a tremendous help in this. I want to thank Catherine. Give a wave right there. There she is. Thank you so much for putting this together. We appreciate you. Also, I want to thank the guy who flew all the way from Florida to come out here. He's the CEO and founder of No More Heroin. He has also helped uh, bring awareness to this and is helping so many people in so many ways across America. The big man himself, Higgy, right hey, there. Yeah. And also, uh, I want to thank the the rock behind this for me, the one that, that bears the blunt of all the, the uh, craziness that goes on in my life that knows everything that uh, she knows everything that's been going on through me on this on this. She's been my rock. She's my ride or die, my 100, my beautiful wife, Maddie, right there for just helping put all this. Love you, Maddie. And then we have some special guests that are going to come up and speak. And they're going to share their stories, and they're going to encourage, they're going to empower, and they're going to make a difference right now. Um, and first we have coming up, uh, this guy is absolutely amazing. Um, he, has, uh, he has written an international best-selling book, it's his memoir, about um, the hiding of his addiction and how he worked through it. And where he's at today, he is a, he is a celebrity sports agent. He is connected ridiculously in the recovery community. Uh, he is a powerhouse. He's out here traveling all over, not just the United States, but all over the world, helping bring awareness to the epidemic of addiction and also speaking life into others. I want to introduce our first speaker, Mr. Darren Prince. Yo, Darren! Thank you guys for having me here. Uh, it's a tremendous honor to be a part of something so special and to raise awareness for such a great cause. What uh, Big Jim and his family and his great team stands for. If we can get to one person today, just one, to help make that change and turn their bottom into their beginning, then I think we've all received a tremendous blessing, right? Yes. So uh, I'll give you the short version of what my life was like, what happened, and what it's uh, like now. I grew up in Livingston, New Jersey loving mother and father and sister and I had a lot of friends growing up, uh, boys and girls, but I never felt a part of. I always felt so different in any setting I was ever put in and uh, socially awkward. I was told I had a learning disability and put in very small classrooms at a very young age and I think because of that, being verbally teased, inadequacies, insecurities, when I first experimented with drugs, I was a prompt candidate to fall victim to addiction, and that happened at 14 years old at sleepaway camp. I had horrible stomach pains one night, and the counselor took me to the infirmary, and I met this nurse that gave me this clear cloth syrup cup with this green liquid in it. And having no idea what it was, boom, it went down, it tasted like complete crap. Five minutes later, my life changed forever. I'm walking across the softball field, go back to the bunk that I felt like Superman. All those naked acquisitions, all those feelings of lesson went right away. I was the cool guy, the funny one, I flirted with the girls. Everybody's like, what's happening to Darren? I wanted more of this feeling. I went to bed that night thinking nothing of it. Woke up the next day, did all my activities, and I'm lying in bed at 14 years old, and I'm looking up at the sky saying, you know, I have no stomach pain right now, but that feeling was amazing that I had last night. I look at the counselor, I yelled over and I said, my stomach's killing me, we've got to go back to the infirmary. So for three straight weeks I did this, so my mom and dad came to speak to the counselors and found that I was taking a liquid Demerol. So, yeah, there's that, that's how it happened, that quickly. A few months later I came back, I had a dentist appointment, and one in three teens nowadays that go to a dentist appointment and get opiates, be chromatic. This one was one of the three. Got a prescription for Vicodin. Went home that night, took a couple of them, I was in pain. 
flying high, the same thing, calling up all my boys on top of the world, loving life. The next day, woke up, thinking I can't wait to get back to school to take more of these things, whatever they were. Two days later, the pills were gone. I look at my mom and said, my tooth is killing me, mom. We gotta go back to the dentist. What does she do as a loving mother who wants to see their son suffer, right? I don't know what's going on. I think I got a bad infection. And he gives me another prescription. I was running hard for another two, three days, loving life. Now, for the next five or six years, I had no repercussions, drugs, alcohol, anything to affect me from the neck up. You name it, I did it. Zero responsibility for life. I got arrested four times at 21 years old. But never once did I look at myself that I had the problem. I blamed it on every other person in my inner circle. Bad timing, bad luck. It wasn't my fault, it was theirs. Wrong place at the wrong time. I was put into a program by the judge called the Alliance of St. Barnabas, and my license was taken away for a year. About a week ago, again, this brilliant brain got this idea to call my friend Dave up and go celebrate. So we did these mind eraser shots in New York City and did a handful of Xanax. Next thing I know, I'm in the hospital in the ICU with 90 stitches in my face. He fell asleep behind the wheel. Who do I see? My mom and dad. With tears in their eyes, completely helpless. What can they do to help their baby boy? Nothing. There's absolutely nothing that they can do. And I had a very successful business. I started a baseball career company as a teenager, got into the sports memorabilia industry, eventually started uh, my agency that I have now, Prince Marketing Group, working with some of the biggest athletes and celebrities in the world. But that brokenness from not speaking up at a young age, from feeling different, from feeling less than, from not feeling a part of, it stuck with me. So when I started the agency, I had these morality clauses, and Magic Johnson was my first client. I said, I'm going to get smart. No more illegal drugs. But the pressure to perform at the highest level in my industry for the talent that I represented, plus sciatica and a lot of physical ailments, I found a way to play that to the hill. Went to some of the best doctors that gave me all the prescriptions I needed. You know, for five or six years, it worked. I do tell people that. But at some point, what was living to use turned out to using to live. I was beyond a point of desperation. So sick and tired and desperate, I didn't know what the hell to do with myself. From the outside, everybody would have thought Darren Prince had a life behind his wild dreams. I was living such a secret, sick, sick life. And I eventually hit a bottom. I had an overdose in 2007. I was in Las Vegas. I came home that following week and I called the addiction psychiatrist to put me on Suboxone. Not thinking I had a problem though. I was on mood stabilizers, anxiety pills, antidepressants, ambient to go to bed at night, and drinking a couple of days a week to the point of blackout. So I had my awakening though, thank God, about six months later. I fell to my knees. I was in my apartment in New York City with the last of my opiates in my hand. I couldn't take it anymore. I called out to God with every fiber of my soul saying, please help me, I'm begging you. For whatever, however it happened, I stood up, I flushed the pills, I wound up on the computer finding a 12-step meeting in New York City, and on the taxi cab ride over thinking, what the heck just happened for the first time in my life, I wanted to stay sober, more than I wanted to get high, that date, July 2nd, 2008, my sobriety date. I walked into this room into a church basement in the upper 90s in New York City. Not knowing anybody, but having no shame, I threw my hand right up. I said, I'm sick, I'm tired, I need help. And these people, these spiritual brothers and sisters were unbelievable. They showed me the softer, easier way to life. They taught me to be accountable. They told me to stick with the winners. And slowly but surely, one day at a time, became a week, became a month, became a year, and my perspective and perception started changing on life. They told me, don't worry if you don't get the fellowship, because if you keep coming, the fellowship is going to get you. And that's exactly what happened. I became so super spiritual and realized along the way the most important thing was not what I can get, but what I can get from this beautiful spiritual life that I have, which is also why I wrote Aiming High. To have this platform to give back and to show people that it doesn't matter if you're from Park Avenue or Park Bench or Yaller Jail, that everybody is up for grabs when it comes to addiction, substance abuse, and alcoholism. It's just the most beautiful experience in my life. And, you know, I was one of those very high bottoms at the highest because most people in my life did not know how sick it got and how bad it got. You know, so I'm very blessed to be standing up here today and, like I said, use this platform 
and uh, you know, be able to spread the message that hope and recovery exists, which is absolutely amazing because it truly does. And you can take your darkest of days and the brightest of lights can come out of it. I found my pain, through my pain, my purpose in life. That's right. Unbelievable, right? Yeah. I found my yeah. soul. Woo! I found my soul on this journey. You know, it's never about Darren Prince, the agent, that life. It was about Darren Prince, the recovery advocate, and having the ability to change lives right now. And I know we're going to get to at least one today, which is the greatest blessing. And outside of that, Big Jim, God bless you. Great to meet my man, Randy Bryan. Yeah! Right there, right? The podcast. Love you guys. Um, let's kick ass and help change and save some lives today with our messages. Good job, good job. <clears throat> Thank you, Darren. You're a beast, man. You just keep doing what you're doing because you're out here making a difference, brother, and we applaud you for what you're doing. Thank you, my brother. Next, we've got an incredible speaker as well. This guy has, uh, this guy is a beast in the recovery community. Uh, you know, to see somebody that uh, has actually put down all the pride, all the selfishness, all the self-centeredness, uh, from where he was and what he's done, what he's been able to accomplish, to where he's at now and still accomplishing even more. Uh, in the NFL, played for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for 10 years. He's a beast. He's one of my mentors, and I'm thankful to have, have him here, Mr. Randy Grimes. Yeah. I'm so grateful to be here today, not only to meet some new friends and meet you guys and, and, and be around people, like-minded people, but also to celebrate a guy who God has laid a mission on his heart, and he's fulfilling that mission right in front of us, right across America, in front of everybody, so I celebrate you, and I can't imagine the thoughts and things that go through your mind when you're on those long stretches across the road, but it's guys like this that are part of the solution, you know, not part of the problem. Guys like this that are tearing down that stigma, you know, with 179 people dying daily as a result of opiate overdose, you would think that the leading cause of death for people under 50, you would think that that would be on the news every night. If it was any other disease besides addiction, it would be the lead story every nightly news, but it's not of the stigma associated with it. You know, I used to be the captain for the Buccaneers for pretty much most of my career, so I would go out at midfield before the game for the coin toss, and I can remember standing, uh, our old stadium was called the, 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 uh, the, the Big Sombrero, and I can remember standing at midfield before a game during the coin toss and looking around the, the, the stands, and I was just in awe of what 80,000 people looked like you know in one place and we did we sold out we were a horrible team but we sold out every week <laughs> but to look at that and i was just in awe of that but you know you take all eighty thousand people that were in the stadium all those days that's how many people die every year as a result of this disease and the stigma attached of it communities bury their head in the sand they think if they don't recognize it, that it's just going to go away. And that's not true. We know that. We're losing a whole generation right in front of our eyes. So thank you for what you're doing, for the people that you're reaching, for what the example you set for not only this community, but for America, that we have to get rid of the stigma and do whatever we can on a daily basis to tear it down. You know, I, when I came into treatment on September 22nd of 2009, I fell out of the car that picked me up in Fort Lauderdale Airport and dropped me off at the treatment center in West Palm. I was so sick, so broken, and it was my last shot, last hope, last chance effort to save my life. And I fell out of that car, and I had another 30 feet to crawl on all fours through the door. But the one thing I remember about that night, and I don't remember it much because I was so sick and so beat up, is that I remember hearing somebody say, Randy, in order to get this, you've got to have the desperation of a drowning man. 
And the reason that had such a huge impact me, on me, even till today, is that as an eight-year-old kid, my most vivid childhood memory is being trapped under the water. I fell off one of those paddle boats and somehow I got my feet caught up underwater and I couldn't get back to the surface. And I remember how desperate I clawed at the water. I remember those feelings and how I was screaming underwater and nobody could hear me and how desperate I was to get back to the top. And when I heard that that night, I knew that I was in for the fight of my life. And listen, I consider myself a pretty tough guy. I've been in a lot of battles against a lot of big, tough, mean son of a guns, okay? For 10 years, for over 10 years, even going back to Baylor University, great players. And I've won most of those battles. You don't get to stay in the NFL for 10 years unless you're winning most of those battles. But when I heard that that night, when I crawled through the door, I knew that I was in for the fight of my life. And I was going to have to do everything and summon every ounce of energy I could to get through it. And you know, going through that process and all the things that they promised me in treatment, and I won't get into the whole thing, but for 20 plus years, I put that lady right there through hell. But she stuck with me. You know, we we met at Baylor University on our first day, our freshman year. We got married after our junior year with just out of love because we didn't have anything. We didn't know anything about our future. She was going to be a teacher. I was going to be a coach. There was no signs of what lied ahead for me. There was no predisposition in my family. I was not supposed to be an addict. But when I got to the NFL, one thing I was always good at was listening. And when I got in that locker room, I listened to the older guys because I wanted to know how they did it. How were they successful? How were they able to feed their family year after year playing a kid's game? How were they able to, to perform at such a high level year after year, go to the Pro Bowl, go to the Super Bowl, all pros? Because that's what Randy wanted to be. Randy wanted to be the greatest center that ever played the game. I wanted to play the game as long as I could, and I wanted to play it on my own terms. And I was willing to do what I had to do. And one of those things was taking handfuls of pain pills every day to stay out on the field. And, and listen, I justified it so easy. I had so many enablers. I, you know, I looked at it more like a necessary evil. And I wanted to feed my family. I wanted to be the best center that I could be. And I had so many enablers. I had team doctors, team trainers, teammates, fans. I had an open drug safe. If I didn't get it from my team doctors or team trainers, I could go get it myself. And if the drug safe was ever locked, we had three white guys that started on defense and their jersey numbers were the combination to the safe. And it was like that the whole 10 years I was there. But I had access to medication. But it wasn't, a, it wasn't an addiction, it was a necessary evil. And, and it even it progressed to the point where the last two years of my 10 year career, I was playing NFL games in a complete blackout. I was taking so much benzodiazepines and so many opiates before the games that I didn't even remember playing the games. I would be home at night, 10 o'clock at night after a 1 o'clock NFL football game that I just played 75 offensive plays in, every play at center, and I didn't remember a single down. I'd be beat up, bruised, scratched, dehydrated, fingernails all tore up, and all the things that you are after an NFL football game, and I didn't remember a single down. But that was the progression of this disease. In the last two years of my career, I played in a complete blackout. You know, I've always, that's always been, other than the misery and the pain that I put my family through, that's one of the biggest things I'm ashamed of because God always put me in the right place at the right time around the right people doing the right thing my whole career. High school, Baylor, NFL, second round pick, all that. And it was like, all right, I'm paying you back by playing the last two years of my career in a blackout. As grateful as, grateful as I am in this great opportunity. But that's the progression of this disease. This was not supposed to happen to Randy Grimes. He didn't fit the profile. Well, yeah, I do. Yeah, I did. And for the next 20 plus years, when Sam Wash put his hand on my shoulder and said, Randy, your services won't be needed anymore. Guys, I didn't know who I was anymore. When I didn't have football, I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how to be a father, a husband, a neighbor, an employee, because that was stripped from me and that was my identity and that's my fault. I let football become who I was instead of something that I did. 
And the reason I bring that up is because that fueled my addiction for many years. It wasn't just about the pain and the injuries. They were just getting worse the older I was getting. My tolerance was just getting higher, so I needed more and more. It was about not knowing who I was, no identity, no self-worth. And for years and years, having great jobs and losing them, having great houses and losing them, having great cars and relationships and losing them, I couldn't stop. I couldn't stop the madness. That was the progression. Confessions of a Liar and a Cheat. Came out right at my 50th birthday. 
I'm recovering from an addiction that requires no substance, requires no liquids, requires no pills, no needles, no smoke. But one in five will attempt suicide, like I did. <clears throat> Twice. So I'm grateful to be here today. Amen. And with my husband, Big Tom. 2.9% of problem gamblers right now in the world. Problem gamblers, 2.9% of people in this whole world are problem gamblers. It took away my house, it took away my car, it almost took away my marriage. I can't tell you how many times I would, my husband would have to go f look for me because I would get up the first thing in the morning, I was so obsessed that I had to go gamble. And I was gambling two, three, four times a day not realizing that I was ruining my financial future, my retirement, my, my everything. I ended up in a crisis center in 2002 from my first suicide attempt. I don't remember being transported to the hospital. I had cuts all over my arms. The police told me they came into my living room and there's knives everywhere. And I was blacking out. Uh, a gambling addiction m really messes with your chemicals. We get the same euphoric high and rush um, as a drug addict or an alcoholic. Um, I am a childhood sex abuse survivor, and um, that is the why. Those are the roots. I had stuffed that those 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 painful feelings for so long until they came back haunting me. Yes. <laughs> All I know is I'm just, I'm, I'm a grateful recovering pathological gambler. Um, I, I really, I, I just, I don't know what, what else to say. I'll, 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 I'll just say I close with um, gambling addiction the venues, the options need to stop expanding. State lotteries, um, casinos, Indian casinos. The more expansion is going to be more addicted gamblers. And um, I'm nervous, so I'm sorry. Um, I'm just proud to be here today. Um, I, I thank Big Jim for doing this and for helping raise awareness about addicted gambling and problem gambling. Um, I will stay with you 100% until this ride is done. Um, that's it, that's all I got to say, I'm sorry. <laughs> I appreciate it, thank you. because 
once I took that very first drink, it gave me the ah that I was looking for, you know? And that, that sense of relief was what I was looking for. That sense of peace and calm in the beginning was what I was looking for. It gave me a place to fit in, you know? It gave me the ability to, to get in where I fit in. And fitting in with people that were doing the wrong things was, was what I was attracted to. I, I, uh, I was a rebel, you know? And I, I had the ability to do and be much more than what I, what I was, was at that time. I, you know, I had a very high IQ, did well in school when I applied myself. But drugs and alcohol throughout the years have taken me out of every positive advance in life. You know, I, I've, I've been to prison because of my drug addiction. I've been homeless. I, I, I was homeless in, in Phoenix, Arizona from, from 1994 to 2002. So I came back here to support my brother, Big Jim. But it's also an opportunity for me to reconcile the past with the present. And I'm, and I'm here to, to be a representative of what Woo! recovery can do for anyone out there that's willing to, you know, apply it to their lives and live by spiritual principles. I, I, I'm the product of a 12-step fellowship and a loving support network and, and the grace and mercy of, of, of a loving God. And I'm so, so grateful to have the opportunity to reach people through my, my, my platform of No More Heroin. I am the CEO of, of No More Heroin. Uh, the website is nomoreheroin.org, and I'm also the, the CEO and owner of A Vision for Veterans, as I am, I am, I am a disabled veteran from the Persian Gulf era. And we, uh, I, I have mul multiple platforms. I use social media to reach people. I travel the country trying to promote this message of recovery. I, I'm connected to a lot of people. And I'll tell you where it began for me on social media was, you may, you may recognize the name Tim Ryan, the dope man. When I first got into recovery five years ago, I was watching watching his Facebook Live. He'd just gotten out of prison, and I could relate to what he was saying. And he he was talking to his community, and he had his parents there, and, and he he was apologizing in public for for the hell that he had put his parents through. And I thought I want to be able to do that because I haven't had any communication with my family since 1994. Know, that I was asked to leave because of my behaviors and I, I haven't been in touch it, um, through my addiction well anyways back to Tim Ryan Tim, Tim Ryan's been a role model for me to follow uh, we're we are we're dear friends and I've watched watched him grow throughout the years and I've applied the same same principles and reaching people that, that he does in his life so I have a lot of great love and admiration admiration Tim Ryan, um, he's doing great things. He just moved out to California, and uh, you know, in, 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 in listening to me speak, I, I want you, I want anyone out there that doesn't believe that they have a purpose in life to look around at the people speaking here. Darren Prince, where is he at? That man is, is a role model for anyone. Do, do you think when when he was suffering at the very bottom of his addiction? Not knowing if he's going to keep his career, you know, not being present with, with all with with his job. Do you think that he thought he would be here today, you know, giving this message of hope? Do you think he even thought about writing a book? That is that is proof recovery works right there. Randy Grimes, amazing, amazing. What, do you think when he was at the, at the death of his addiction, struggling to get out of bed, full of pain and misery, and just craving drugs? And, and, and going through withdrawals on a daily basis. Do you think that he thought he would be here today spreading this message of hope or even have a career in helping other people? This man has, has a career that, that spans a, a long period of time. I, I, you're just a role model. I, I, I've, I've sought, sought you out for five years to meet you, and it's an honor to meet you. Big Jim, when, you, when he was homeless, and just at the bottom of his addiction, do you think he thought he would be able to inspire anybody, anybody? Let alone get on a bicycle and pedal around America. Woo! Jackson Pierce is here from Phoenix, amazing musician. Yeah. At the bottom of his addiction, do you think he thought he would be able to make music and inspire people? Woo. Role model, recovery is real, 
We come out here to recover out loud because recovery is possible for anybody. Yeah. Tell him, Higgy. You know, it's, an, it's an honor. It's a true, true honor to be able to stand in the presence of all of you guys. You know, and stand with my head held high, you know, because I did, I, I the, the streets of Phoenix stripped me of every ounce of dignity and self-respect, and my addiction just tore me apart and killed me, killed me in my soul, and, and I'm so grateful to be back in Phoenix and say, look at me now, baby! that I, I, I want to give a shout out to anybody that's fighting for their life in recovery and please share this video take it with you show it to somebody else because we, we, we need role models out there in the community doing the right thing for the right reasons and again I'm Higgy and I invite you to check out No More Heroin on Facebook and tune into the Survivor Series because the Survivor Series showcases inspirational testimonies from people that have overcome Seemingly insurmountable odds, like all of us here today. Yeah! All walks of life, you know, it doesn't matter how far down you are. You can pick yourself back up with a loving support system, a loving God, a program of recovery. And I'm glad to be here. My name is Higgy, and I love you all. Peace. Love you, Higgy! Oh, yes! This is just so awesome, listening to all these inspirational speakers that have gone through it. Higgy, we thank you so much for all that you're doing, brother. Woo! Woo! Come on, baby. We need, Darren, we need, we need, the, uh, yeah, we need an H boy. We, we need Ric Flair all up in there. Woo! Woo! Hey, all right, uh, next, uh, you guys are going to hear a very powerful uh, testimony from a very powerful woman. Uh, she's the most beautiful woman here. I'm sorry. I'm kind of... Uh, partial and she is absolutely amazing and she's she's the one that inspires me and pushes me and and when i'm down she she lifts me up and she makes an, a, an impact in my life every day uh she is a survivor of uh she's a survivor of addiction she's a survivor of kidnapping she's, she was sold into the uh, sex trafficking, she was sold as a slave, she escaped, she raised five children single, she is an amazing strong woman that is a true survivor, my beautiful wife, Mari Sol. Yo, Mari, let's go! Bring it, Love you, Mari. Bring it. That's what we did. 
So now that I have Christ as my Lord and Savior, I knew that it was Him every step of the way. But every day, He will give me the strength to be able to get up and keep on walking, to get up and keep on fighting, to get up and keep on doing what I needed to do, to get up and know that now my focus is on my children so that they will not wind up where I was, so that they can have a better future, so that they can have a better opportunity in this world. So I got up and I started walking and the Lord opened opportunity for me to go to school. So I, I got my high school diploma in 2005. And then I, put, I went to college as a criminal justice, paralegal, and as a nurse. So after I did all that, I was able to offer my children something because I didn't have nothing to offer them, not even food, not a roof over their head. We slept in back of a vehicle when we had absolutely nothing, nothing. So I praise the Lord for this opportunity and this chance that to be able to be out here, letting everybody know that chains can be broken, walls can be knocked down, God's right. grace and mercy is sufficient, that anybody that doesn't believe or doesn't think, I am your hope. Come on. I am your hope. Right. I am your testimony. I stand here before all of y'all letting you know that there Woo. is a way. All you have to do is want it. All you have to do is seek it. Just like you seek the addiction. Just like you go out looking for the dope, go out and look for the recovery. Go out and look for a place that can help you and lead you the right path and the right direction so that you can get the right help so that you can live the life that God has intended for you to live. I'm not standing here for myself. I'm standing here to give God the grace that because of His grace, His love, I'm feeling love and mercy. I stand here, live, I stand here before all of y'all telling y'all that I am a living testimony that God is real and that recovery is possible for anyone and anybody that wants it. Thank you. Wow, that's amazing right there. She's a beast. She's a beast. She's my beast. You can't have her. Mama bear. She's mama bear. Now it comes my turn to speak, and then we're going to ask anyone that wants to come up here and speak to have the freedom to do so. Um, I lived in uh, active addiction for 34 years. 34 years of hardcore addiction. Started drinking and, and, and smoking weed and all that at 12. At 14, I graduated quickly to doing peanut butter crank, doing meth. I, I moved into the dark side of the world quickly. And uh, my addiction took hold and it destroyed me quickly. Addiction doesn't happen overnight, it happens over time. And over time, uh, this guy was so blinded by addiction that I was that kind of a parent. I was horrible at everything. I was a horrible parent. I'm the one that stuck a glass pipe in my teenager's mouth and said, you're going to do dope with me. Because that's what I thought that this world was about. I lived in the dark side. I ruined five marriages because of my addiction. I ruined every relationship there was. I hurt innocent people for no reason. I was blinded by addiction. I was not Jim Downs. I was not who I was supposed to be. But through recovery, through recovery, I, I, I was able to introduce myself to hope. And hope has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I, I introduced myself to him, and we started having conversation, and our conversation became this thing called a relationship. And since I gave myself away and got rid of me and realized that there is something much bigger than Jim, much bigger than this big Jim, much, much more important than big Jim, and, it, and, and it's called him. And when I gave my life up and started living for him, my life changed dramatically east to west. Instead of hating and wanting to bash someone's face in, now I want to just grab them, hug them, and lift them up. And that's why you see there's a lot of hugging and a lot of caring and compassion here because that's what recovery does. It takes you from this selfish, self-centered, prideful person. And when you recover now, you get to be who you're supposed to be. A loving, kind, caring, compassionate, empathetic person. This person that was, that was pushed to the side is now 
out here and let me tell you something about recovery. It feels really good. Yeah. Recovery yeah. has a whole nother attitude about it. You you smile. You're able to do things that you would normally say, and I'm not going to do that. You're like, hey, you know what? Hey, I, I can make it work out. Let me move this around. This guy over here moved his entire schedule around and in about three hours is going to be on a plane going, where, where are you going next? Going to Cali. You know, Randy and Lydia, they came out here for a day. They're back on a plane tomorrow. You know, they, this is what recovery does. It goes from keeping you closed up inside your house with the windows and the shades closed to opening up, seeing the world and understanding, stepping into what you, what we call our intended purpose. I'm going to say this. I'm going to take a leap of faith and say that this guy and that guy has more fans now than they ever had in their life. I'm going to probably say that. You might have been really good at football, my brother, but I bet you got a bigger following now than you did when you was playing football. This guy right here is a beast. He's all over the place hugging people, and his hugs they're huge and they feel great they're awesome and he's sharing his story and he's lifting people up and making a difference Darren's doing the same thing he's going to be over here signing his bestseller his book for donations to help keep this going on to help keep spreading the message of hope for everyone that spoke would you guys mind coming up here for a minute please Randy come up here Higgy Darren Kat I want everyone to look at this. I, I want to I make something real clear here. What you see in front of you is a professional football player, a sports celebrity agent, you see a veteran, you see an author, you see an agricultural picking in the field And you see a guy that does floors. Addiction loves everyone. Addiction has no boundaries. It doesn't care what color you are. It doesn't care your social status. It doesn't care how wealthy you are. It doesn't care. All addiction wants to do is embrace you and love you. And it wants to suck the life out of you. But I also want you to look at this. We are on common ground. There is no one here better than anyone. There is no one here below anyone. We are brothers and sisters in recovery. We are here to share our stories, to be able to lift you up, to educate, to be able to make a difference in Arizona and all the rest of the states that are coming. We can make a difference today. We can make a difference tomorrow. And the one thing that we can say that we are doing, we're surviving. And to crush the stigma, we're not letting our past define our tomorrow. I encourage everyone out here to make a difference in someone's life. If you see them struggling, love on them. Don't turn your back on them. Don't turn away from them. Go love them. If you see a person on the streets that is homeless with a sign, have a conversation with them. The words that you speak into them can change their life. You have an opportunity. Everyone here and everyone out there in Facebook land and everyone here in Arizona has an opportunity to be able to change lives for the good. I pray that today is a miraculous day. It does just that. And it shows an example of incredible people coming together to make a difference right now. So we thank every one of you for coming out. We want everyone to come up. We want everyone to follow the ride. We want everyone to encourage other states to do exactly this. And we want everyone to make Coming out here. Woo! They're $20 a book. Come up here, get a book, make a difference.
Randy's going to be signing footballs. Yes, you are. <laughs> and we thank everyone so much. Good, man. How are you, you doing? All right. Yeah, I'm doing great. How are you? Thank you very much for coming out here. Absolutely, it's beautiful. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Powerful coming. stuff, huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Darren B A R. Randy Grimes. R A N D Y G R I M E S. Thank you, Randy. Love you, Steve. We'll get there one day, y'all. Higgy Robin Higginbotham. H I G G Y R O B I N. H-I-G-G-I-N-B-O-T-H-A-N. I might be speaking in a minute. Would you mind holding us? Sure. Important. Um, Talk to Michelle. Aaron Prince, B-A-R-R-E-N. P-R-I-N-C. I think I texted you about that off like two months ago. I know we already have somebody who wants to come up and share. We're going to get Randy Grimes and Jackson Pierce. Randy Grimes and Jackson Pierce. And anybody else who wants to come up and share. Wrong, so it really was a cry for help that saved my life. 
and um, you know, here I am, you know, a couple of years later, you know, I my music has become an inspiration to people, and it's very humbling to me that my my terrible experience has become something that people find uh, strength, hope, and, and encouragement through. And um, I'm just very grateful that uh, that Cat and Higgy asked me to speak. I'm grateful for you, Jim, for what you're doing, uh, bringing awareness to all 48 states. I think that's amazing. Uh, that's more amazing than anything I could ever do for the community. Um, but I just want to thank you guys for having me here and just uh, finding this fight with me. All right, guys, we got things going on. We got Darren over here signing his international bestseller uh, for a $20 donation. It's to fun, help keep this ride rolling. Uh, 